Uh, for Keith Day, I'd like you to meet Bajan Martinenko. Sorry, what's her name? Bajan Martinenko. Mm -hmm. What sort of thing is that? It's Ukrainian. It's Russian, isn't it? No, it's Ukrainian. Ukrainian? What's that? Where is that? So where and what is Ukraine? Ukraine is located in southeastern Europe, directly north of the Black Sea. It is one of the 15 constituent Soviet republics of the USSR. Ukraine is situated in an important position between the Russian SFSR, itself a federation, and the various satellite countries of Eastern Europe. It occupies an area of 234,000 square miles, which makes it larger than any European country, excluding Russia. Many people often confuse Russia with the USSR, otherwise known as the Soviet Union. In fact, the Russians account for just over half the total population of the Soviet Union. That means that today there are at least 120 million non-Russians, with their own languages, culture and historical traditions, living in the Soviet Union. The largest 14 non-Russian nations are formally welded to the Russians in a federal arrangement, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, though, in practice, this federation is run as a Russian-dominated unitary state. The Ukrainians are by far the largest non-Russian nation in the USSR. The population of Ukraine in 1973 was just over 48 million, of whom about 75% were Ukrainians. More than 6 million Ukrainians live in the USSR beyond the borders of the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. Ukraine is extremely rich in natural resources. It has a favorable climate and a very fertile soil. Ukraine was once known as the granary of Europe. The country also has vast energy and mineral resources. In 1970, Ukraine produced one-third of the total Soviet coal output, just under a third of the natural gas, 40% of the steel, and 57% of the Soviet Union's iron ore. Situated on the banks of the Dnieper River is the ancient Ukrainian city of Kiev. It is the capital of what today is a highly industrialized and technologically advanced country. If nature has endowed their country with abundant natural wealth, history has certainly not been as kind to the Ukrainians. Located in an area which for centuries was regarded as the border between Europe and Asia, this land has attracted all manner of invaders, conquerors and empire builders. Mongols, Poles, Turks, Austrians, Germans and Russians. The history of the Ukrainians has been an almost continuous story of resistance against foreign domination. A struggle for national survival, often in seemingly hopeless conditions. Their alien rulers, on occasions, would simply deny their existence as a distinct nation, or contemptuously refer to them as little Russians or little Poles. Although one of Europe's forgotten peoples in more recent times, the Ukrainians' history may be traced continuously from the medieval state of Kiev and Rus. In ten years' time, in 1988, Ukrainians all over the world will be celebrating a thousand years of Christianity, which was introduced into Kiev by Volodymyr the Great. In the 17th century, at the same time as Oliver Cromwell was fighting for parliamentary rights and privileges, the Ukrainian Cossacks had defeated the Polish monarchy and were consolidating their state according to republican and democratic principles. At the turn of this century, the territory populated by Ukrainians had been divided for over a hundred years, the western part having gone to Austria-Hungary. The larger Russian-ruled part had suffered the harsh policies of Tsarist autocracy, including prohibition of the Ukrainian language. But in both parts, repression had encouraged the process of national regeneration, which was spurred on by the fiery words of the great national poet, Taras Shevchenko. In 1917, when Tsarist autocracy disintegrated, the Ukrainians ambitiously seized the opportunity to solve, at one stroke, the two long-standing inseparable problems of national oppression and social and economic exploitation. In March, a government was formed in Kyiv, 
the Ukrainian Central Rada. And on January the 22nd, 1918, independence was declared. But the granary of Europe was in great demand, and by the end of 1919, Bolshevik Russian troops had reconquered four-fifths of Ukraine. The remaining western part was taken by Poland. Under Soviet rule, despite an initial period in the 20s, when they were allowed some cultural concessions, the Ukrainians suffered the largest catastrophe in their history since the Mongol invasion. During Stalin's collectivization drive in the early 30s, at least six million Ukrainians starved to death in the largest artificial famine ever known. Over the next few years, hundreds of thousands more were liquidated during the Great Purges. When the Second World War began, it was not surprising that there was so little love for Soviet rule amongst Ukrainians. Many of them hoped the war would provide the opportunity to restore Ukrainian independence. The Germans, however, treated Ukraine as a colony and its inhabitants as a subservient race. More than two million Ukrainians were taken away for forced labor. Meanwhile, the UPA, a Ukrainian underground army, arose. In action originally against the Germans, the UPA was to continue the fight for Ukrainian independence against the Russians until the end of the 1940s. At the end of the Second World War, there were some two million Ukrainians in Germany. After attempts to forcibly repatriate them had been abandoned, they were given up the opportunity of remaining in the West. Many of them went to North America. Some 40,000 Ukrainians stayed in this country. It's important to understand from the very start that Ukrainians regard themselves as political refugees who could not return home because of the prevailing oppressive conditions there. The hope in a brighter and better future for their homeland has conditioned the nature of community life in this country over the past 30 years. And coming to Britain, most of them were either in their teens or early 20s. They experienced a total culture shock. Coming from predominantly agricultural backgrounds, they had to make their way as alien members of Britain's industrial workforce. These conditions naturally encouraged them to draw together and over the years, they managed to build up a well-organized and close-knit community. The Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain remains our largest and most important organization, though there is a smaller organization, the Federation of Ukrainians in Great Britain. Many other organizations were established to cater for the needs of particular sections of the community. For example, women's organizations, youth organizations, and many of us. Ukrainian community life revolves around two main focal points, the community centers and the churches. There are over 50 such community centers distributed from Dundee to London, with a large concentration in Greater Manchester and West Yorkshire. As far as religion is concerned, most Ukrainians belong to either the Ukrainian Catholic Church or the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. In the 30 years, the Ukrainian community has managed to found a nursing home for the disabled two old age pensioners' homes, two summer youth camps, one in North Wales, one in Derbyshire, a Ukraine cooperative, several self-enterprising businesses. We have decided to take a look at the events which take place inside of a large Ukraine community, in this case, Manchester's. With Walter Eaton Jones accompanying, Yaroslav Bobniak is conducting the girls' choir, Krimbita. holds many artifacts belonging to the Association of Ukrainian Women in Great Britain. This organization represents the Ukrainian women within the community, works with English women's organizations, and brings up Ukrainian children with a love for their country and its traditions. Nearly every community center has a Ukrainian Saturday school. Here the children are taught to read and write Ukrainian, 
as well as the basics of Ukrainian history, literature, and geography. In this memo, Olivets. Olivets, yet The male voice choir, Homin, conducted by Yaroslav Babunyak, again accompanied by Walter Eaton Jones, has a long tradition of good quality singing. We see them here rehearsing the song Travinkitaycha for a Silver Jubilee concert. Most Ukrainians are churchgoers. Here we see the Ukrainian Catholic Church in Manchester. At the moment, Ukrainian Catholics are in the middle of a dispute concerning the Vatican's reluctance to confer patriarchal status on the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Manchester also has a Ukrainian Orthodox Church. The Ukrainian Youth Association in Manchester has a mixed choir called Rusalka Dnistrova, which is conducted by Stefan Hunka. Besides the choir, the Ukrainian Youth Association holds regular meetings, organizes outings, and when necessary, political demonstrations. Ukrainian scout organization gives its young members not only the principles of world scouting but also emphasizes the Ukrainian language, culture and traditions. The Orlik dancing group is one of the largest in this country. Some of its members are seen here performing the Hutul dance Kolomeika. The choreographers are Maria Babic and Dmitro Parayuk. Orlik has participated in many national and international festivals with considerable success. As you saw, Ukrainians in Great Britain retain very strong emotional ties with their home country and they do everything they can to preserve their millennial culture, a culture whose origins reflect the Ukrainian nation's Scythian ancestors, the golden period of the Kievan state, when architecture, iconography and mosaicry were the products of the most developed medieval civilization in Eastern Europe. The 12th century epic poem about Prince Ihor's campaign against the Polovtians is one of the first written works in a literature which bore, in the 19th century, Taras Shulchenko, and later, Franco and Ukrainka. A considerable contribution to world culture has been made by such Ukrainians as the 18th century composer Bortniansky, the writer and cinematographer Dolzhenko, the sculptor Archipenko, Ukraine, especially in Kiev and Vil, has a strong tradition of opera and ballet. The towns always fostered learning and the fine arts. The villages also played a great part in cultural development. It is in the villages, among the golden wheat fields of Ukraine, that the rich and varied folk arts arose. The Ukrainian village people's strong aesthetic sense cultivated throughout thousands of years, has made them transform the most utilitarian of objects into works of art.
Another necessity of life which has been transformed into an art is cookery and baking. As on Christmas Eve, when each family, when the first star rises, places a lighted candle in their window to invite in any homeless strangers. They say a prayer and sit down to a meal consisting of 12 dishes to symbolize the 12 apostles. A folk art which has symbolic rather than utilitarian significance is the decoration of Easter eggs. Eggs, the symbol of fertility and new life, were already being decorated in Ukraine at least 3,000 years before Christ. They were offered as a gift to the sun god at the pagan festival of spring. Motifs used were the reindeer, the tree of life, the horse, the bird, the never-ending line, symbols of long life, happiness and prosperity. With the advent of Christianity, the fish, church and cross appeared in designs. As used to be done in the villages, Ukrainians in Great Britain decorate these eggs, the Sankhye, during Lent, and on Easter Sunday take them to church to be blessed, together with the Easter basket containing a special bread, pasca, sausage, butter, cheese and horseradish. Music is a very important part of Ukrainian folk art. Ukrainians love singing, and they have a wide variety of folk songs. Even very small villages had their own folk choirs, and Ukrainians in Great Britain carry on this tradition. There are many choirs composed of both young and older Ukrainians who bring the sad and cheerful sounds of village life, the birds, the streams, the rustling trees, Ukrainians in this country. Of the various folk instruments played by Ukrainians in this country, most popular is the bandura, the 56 stringed instrument first used in the 17th century by the Cossack Kobzar, the minstrels who used to wander from village to village, telling of the nation's heroic past. Another form of folk art which is carefully preserved and developed, almost exclusively among the young, is dancing. There are many groups, large and small, all over Britain. It is the desire of most young Ukrainians to possess their own national costume, an outward symbol of their belonging to the Ukrainian community. This may be, as on the right, the popular costume from Kiev, or, in the centre, the dress from Poltava, and the girl on the left is wearing the beautifully embroidered Hutzel costume, reflecting the greens, oranges and yellows of the Carpathian Mountains. And here you see two others. On the right, the dark, elegant costume of Ternopil in western Ukraine, with the sleeves heavily embroidered. And finally, the cheerful dress from Yavori in the Lviv region. Young Ukrainians born in Great Britain have a strong wish to preserve their culture and practice the folk arts whenever they can. Also, using traditional frameworks, they create new forms of Ukrainian art, music and dress. In present-day Ukraine, however, the Soviet authorities use both subtle and brutal means to suppress the culture. Not only is Russification a government policy, historical and cultural monuments and especially churches, are physically destroyed, as described by imprisoned poet Ihor Kalinet. The eternal rafters were creaking. The beams were flying like feathers. They were ruining a wooden miracle of human labor and faith. And engraved on the gentle mountains, the domes were swaying their last. They died undaunted and proud, as die the last of a race and the icons sought final shelter 
among the surrounding weeds and a hopeful Madonna was weeping in her shattered brain. Ukrainians in this country have frequently displayed their concern and indignation about what is happening in Ukraine, sometimes in the form of protests, like the one when the former Soviet secret police chief Alexander Shalepin came to Britain in 1975. They are deeply concerned not only by the flagrant and widespread violation of human and national rights in Ukraine, but also by the Soviet policy of Russification, that is, the denationalization of the non-Russian nations of the USSR and their assimilation into the dominant Russian culture. Following the death of Stalin, a brief period of relaxation in the nationality sphere made possible a remarkable revival in the cultural and public life of Ukraine. It was spearheaded by the courageous generation of the 60s, composed mainly of young literary intellectuals who boldly opposed Khrushchev's decision to step up once again the policy of Russification. A wave of arrests in 1965 not only failed to silence dissenters in Ukraine, but actually precipitated the emergence of a Ukrainian human and national rights movement. In 1970, the young Ukrainian historian Valentin Moroz received a draconian 14-year sentence for his powerful protest writing. At the beginning of 1972, the KGB launched a massive crackdown in Ukraine, which was designed to crush the growing national assertiveness of the Ukrainians. Purges affected every sector of Ukrainian life, and even Petro Shelis, the party boss in Ukraine, was removed from his post. Hundreds of persons, mainly young writers, artists and scholars, were sentenced to inhumanly severe terms of imprisonment. The most talented and courageous representatives of an entire generation are now in labor camps, prisons and psychiatric hospitals. We asked Peter Redway, an authority on Soviet affairs, about the importance of the Ukrainian problem. I think of all the many different forms of dissent in the Soviet Union that have developed in the last 15 years or so, the national minority dissent is what worries the authorities more than anything else. The strongest movements have been in the Ukraine and Lithuania, with important but less powerful movements in Latvia, Estonia, Georgia, Armenia and a few others. The seriousness of the Ukrainian problem relates, I think, to the fact that the Ukraine is economically so important to the Soviet Union and that if a strong national movement was able to express itself, secessionist tendencies might develop and Ukraine might eventually secede from the Union. So the KGB has cracked down very, very hard in the mid-60s and again in 1972, suppressing virtually all forms of national Ukrainian dissent. And I think they put it at the very top of their priorities in dealing with discontent and dissent. Today, conditions in Ukraine remain extremely oppressive. The most recent example concerns the 1975 Helsinki Agreement, which included provisions about human rights. As in other parts of the Soviet Union, a group to monitor the Soviet government's observance of this international agreement was set up in Ukraine at the beginning of 1977. Though the Soviet government is a signatory of the Helsinki Final Act, it has responded by imprisoning at least six members of this small group. In June 1977, the Ukrainian Helsinki Group's chairman, the well-known writer Mykola Rudenko, received a sentence of 12 years. His colleague, the teacher, Alexa Tichy, was sentenced to a staggering total of 15 years. A couple of weeks ago, another two members of this group were both given 12-year sentences. Very recently, a, a wider movement in defense of workers' rights in the USSR has emerged, headed by Volodymyr Khlebanov and other Ukrainians. The Soviet attitude towards the Ukrainian problem can be seen in this tonight interview of last year with one of the editors of Pravda. There are all kinds of things happening in the Soviet Union which simply do not appear in Pravda. For instance, at the moment, there are two members of the Ukrainian Helsinki Committee who are being tried on charges of anti-Soviet activity. Why is this trial not reported in the Soviet press? Fine. If that's what you're interested in, it's your affair. But as far as the legal activities of the entire Soviet Union are concerned, well, of course, we can't report every single case or every trial. 
Естественно, точно так же, как в английской прессе не сообщается, наверное, о всей деятельности английских судей. It's natural. Just as the English press probably doesn't print accounts of every single action by the British legal authorities or organs. Если же вы имеете в виду, uh, в виду людей, которых... But if you're talking about people that the Western, the bourgeois press makes out to be martyrs, well, those people, we've got a word for them here, malcontents. They represent no one, and their activities don't interest our readers either. Деятельность тоже не интересует наших читателей. But if, for instance, there were a group of people who were arguing the case for, say, a, a separatist movement in the Ukraine, Where could, in which newspaper in the Soviet Union, could they express their views? We don't have any such group. If there were such a group. And if the Martians landed in England? And if Triffids marched on London, what then? Behind the facade of a federal structure, the USSR remains a vast Russian empire. The constitutional rights of the non-Russian republics exist only on paper. All important decisions are made in Moscow. Even though Soviet Ukraine has its own seat at the United Nations, foreign diplomats and journalists are not allowed to work in this republic. Any complaints about the denial of basic civil liberties, russification and national discrimination are answered with repression. The Soviet authorities have not only made Russification state policy at home, they also skillfully encourage the erroneous belief abroad that Russia and the Soviet Union are one and the same thing. Unfortunately, they are aided in this by frequent slack reporting, outright carelessness or ignorance, as in this example concerning the Ukrainian sprinter Borzov, which has resulted in the virtual acceptance by the British press and television as conventional practice that for the Soviet Union or USSR read Russia. By doing so, the British media effectively denies the existence of the non-Russian nations that make up the USSR, the Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Georgians, Uzbeks, Armenians, just an honest Russian, Vladimir Bukovsky, who himself spent 12 years in Soviet prisons for his human rights activity. Bukovsky concluded his letter with the following words. Considering that many of those currently imprisoned in the USSR were persecuted for defending their national cultures and languages, the least that can be done in the West is to ensure that the difference between Russia proper and the Soviet Union is understood and that the two terms are not used interchangeably. Hi. What's your name? Bostanka Sklarenko. What? Bostanka Sklarenko. What kind of a name is that? It's Ukrainian. What? It's Ukrainian. <laughs>